remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And since the last time we talked, since our last show, A&E Networks have now backed down and lifted their suspension of Phil Robertson from the Duck Dynasty show. Likewise, Cracker Barrel, who had initially pulled some Duck Dynasty merchandise from their shelves, they've backed down and have restocked that Duck Dynasty merchandise and practically apologized to the American public for their misjudgment. So clearly, this week has been a victory for traditional Americans everywhere. Now, last week on this show, we talked about how Phil Robertson's comments, well, while they were comments that a reasonable person could disagree with, they were not comments that a reasonable person could find uh, intolerant or hateful or even offensive. Well, clearly, that struck a chord with the American people, the traditional Americans, the mainstream Americans, when these companies went above and beyond and tried to, to assist and aid and abet those on the fringes of society from shutting down Phil Robertson's speech. And Phil Robertson's beliefs, but I think it was a, it was a great moment in history when those of us who saw what was happening rose up and said, "Don't you dare do it! We stand by Phil Robertson." Now, on the heels of such a great win for mainstream America, such a great win for traditional Americans, such a great win for those of us who are political conservatives, what is there that we can learn from this? Is there a lesson we can take from this? Is there a lesson that America can take from it, that businesses can take from this? I believe that there is. And I think the message, the lesson that we can take from it is summed up in one line from the Cracker Barrel statement that they released when they reinstated the Duck Dynasty merchandise. As part of their statement, Cracker Barrel said this, and I quote, Our intent was to avoid offending, but that's just what we've done. That says it all right there, doesn't it? That as a company, Cracker Barrel and A&E were so focused on not offending certain people that they did not realize they were offending everybody else. Now, don't get me wrong. On the face of it, it's understandable why businesses want to avoid offending people. I mean, I don't care what business you're in. I don't care what you're selling, what good or service you're selling. You want to have as much of a catchment area as you can for a potential customer base. That's understandable. So you don't want to offend people and, and, and get them hacked off to the point that they won't spend money with you. Understand that. And so when, when someone on the fringes of society, such as you know some group like GLAD who claims to represent gays, but really they only represent that small group of gay people that want to radically change society, when they claim they're offended, it may seem it's easier to just bend over backwards, accommodate them no matter how asinine what they're saying is, and just quietly make the issue go away. Or likewise, in a group like the NAACP that claims to represent African Americans, but really they only represent that small number of African Americans who are militant and who think society needs to radically change, when they get offended, it's easier sometimes to think that you can just accommodate them and it'll quietly go away. Now is like that, the National Organization for Women, when it comes to offending women, they claim to represent women. No, they don't. They represent radical feminists. There's all kinds of these little groups on the left. And for years and decades, they have made hay out of being professionally offended and effectively holding businesses hostage. They've used this tactic to hold businesses hostage and, and to gain traction for the change that they advocate in society. Even though it's not a change that the majority wants, it's just a change that their little fringe wants. But they use this as an offensive tactic. But what we're seeing after this Duck Dynasty episode is that traditional Americans and political conservatives of this generation have gotten wise to that tactic. And we are now starting to use those same tactics for good instead of evil. You see, businesses this week were confronted with a question that I don't think most of them have ever thought of before. What happens when you bend over backwards not to offend one small group of people, but that very action ends up offending a far larger number of people? True, there might have been a few gay people who were offended at uh, Phil Robertson's comments, but there are far more traditional Americans who are offended at A&E's reaction to them and Cracker Barrel's reaction to them. And that, I think, is the story here. That, I think, is what we should learn. So now, going forward, businesses are going to have to weigh 
the, val the validity of appealing and trying not to offend these little fringe elements of society who pipe up every now and then. If, they have to ask themselves, if I count out of those small groups of people, am I going to hack off the rest of America? And you've got some evidence here that you very well might. Now, there's one more small part of this Phil Robertson uh, controversy that I want to touch on. And be honest about it, this is, this is a part of the controversy that really hasn't gotten as much attention as the gay part did, but uh, I've heard a few people talk about it. And last week, uh, Jesse Jackson was out snooping around trying to get some kind of FaceTime out of this and wanting to, to talk to A&E and so forth. And I guess he saw a microphone around and he wanted to get a hold of it. And I've even had someone on Facebook ask me about this, so let's go ahead and touch on this. There were some people during this controversy who claimed that some of Phil Robertson's comments in the GQ article were anti-black, or they were racially insensitive, or they were negative towards African Americans. Racist in some way. Crying racism yet again. But is that true? Let's look at Robertson's actual words in terms of African Americans in that GQ article, and then let's make that judgment. Here is what Robertson said, and I'm quoting. I never with my eyes saw the mistreatment of any black person, not once. Where we lived was all farmers. The blacks worked for the farmers. I hoed cotton with them. I'm with the blacks because we're white trash. We're going across the field. They're singing and happy. I never heard one of them, one black person say, I tell you what, those doggone white people. Not a word. Okay, so digesting all of that, for those of you who think blacks should be angry with Phil Robertson over this, let me ask you a question. In what he said there, where did Phil Robertson ever say anything negative about African Americans? I didn't see anything there. All Phil Robertson said was that at the time, in the 1960s, where he was at, he did not witness any mistreatment of African Americans. So, to those of you who are offended, I'd like to ask you a question. What was Robertson supposed to do? Was he supposed to lie about what he saw? Was he supposed to lie about maybe what he didn't see? Was he supposed to lie about his own experiences during that point in history where he was at? Now, some of you are incredulous about this, and you think that it would be impossible for a man to live in the South in the 1960s and not see rife mistreatment of blacks all over the place. Much like me, you're probably of my age, and you've probably seen all the footage that I've seen from the South in the 1960s where you see the water hoses and the attack dogs and the policemen beating blacks and the whole thing. All right, I've seen that footage too. And you probably see that, and let's face it, visual, uh, visual depictions are very powerful. They, they, they resonate with people. So you've probably seen that, and you probably think that that was the case all over the South in the 1960s. But really, that's not true. I'm not denying that... I'm not denying the mistreatment happened and that it was widespread to some degree, but I'm saying that the footage you saw, the, the visions you have of the water hoses and the dogs and everything else, was the exception more than the rule. Now, some of you, your jaw is on the floor, but let me, let me give you a little bit of historical information here. Think back to Martin Luther King Jr. And we've seen, of course, his, uh, you know, the, the marches he was a part of and the demonstrations he was a part of in a lot of the big cities in the South. Back at that time, Birmingham, Memphis, a lot of places, all right? Now, you may be surprised to know, and it probably wasn't taught to you in school, that Martin Luther King, going with the uh, idea of nonviolence as a way to advance his movement, that Martin Luther King understood that for his, uh, for his movement to work, the eyes of the nation would have to be upon it, that people outside the South would have to see it, they'd have to get behind him, and in order to do that, you've got to take... You, you, you've got to have a certain degree of violence uh, demonstrated upon you that you don't react to so that people will kind of sympathize with you and get on your side. And you may be surprised to know that initially King had some difficulty actually finding that in the South. What? You, you didn't read that in your textbook at school? Oh, it's true. Let me give you an example here. One of the first places that King went in order to get his demonstration rolling and his... Uh, his movement against desegregation rolling was Albany, Georgia. Albany, Georgia in the South. And he did not find down there the things that he later found in Birmingham. I'm going to quote to you now from a book called Before the Storm. This is by a guy named Rick Perlstein. And this is one of the best books out there 
on the political environment of America in the early 1960s. Ostensibly, it's a book about Barry Goldwater, but really, it's a book about America in the early 1960s. And while Rick Perlstein is not a guy that I agree with politically, I would say from a historical perspective, this book is probably the best treatment, the most well-rounded treatment of that era of American history that I've ever read. He also did a book called Nixon Land that takes up the late 1960s. Another excellent book. I cannot recommend those two books highly enough. But I want to demonstrate for you from his book what happened when Dr. King tried to implement his movement in Albany, Georgia. Quoting directly from Pearlstein here, King's method of nonviolence worked by putting evil on display by absorbing oppression's blows in the spirit of loving kindness. But Albany's police smartly handled their arrests peacefully, undramatically, or simply neglected to make any arrests at all. In 1963, King decided the movement would do better in Birmingham. He counted on Bull Connor as a more reliable outrage to the nation's conscience. And as history turned out, King was absolutely right. He got all the action you could ask for in Birmingham and maybe more. Point of it is this. If the violence that we've seen in this footage over the years has been relayed to us in our textbooks, if the water cannons and attack dogs and tear gas and all of these things was so prevalent, was, was something you would see every time you'd walk out your door if you lived in the South in the early 1960s, then why did King have to go to Birmingham? He could have put his movement down anywhere and, and made hay. But the historical facts are that he couldn't. He had to go where the action was. Now, if you look at the African American population today, it's about 13 or 14 percent of the total population of America. Back then it might have been a little bit less, but around 10 to 14 percent. Okay. If you look at a population density map, you'll see that African Americans are largely clustered around major urban areas. So what that means is if you live in a rural area, particularly in the South in the 1960s, you would not see a great number of African Americans interacting with, with other people. They just weren't there. So therefore, how could you possibly see great numbers of mistreatment of African Americans when very few of them are around to begin with? In Robertson's case, the few that were around worked right alongside him on the farm. So he did not see mistreatment of African Americans, or he claims that he didn't see it, and it's totally plausible. Now, I'll admit that if Robertson had spent a lot of time in a bigger city in the South back then, Birmingham, New Orleans, Memphis, then I would be more skeptical about what he says on this subject. But given that he was in a rural part of Louisiana, which was not where a great deal of the action that we've seen in later generations on the footage, not where a lot of that action took place. Not saying it didn't happen at all, but the, the, the key parts of that movement, the key protests and so forth were not there. It's entirely plausible that he may not have seen any mistreatment. So with that in mind, I want you to think about something. Are we really at a point in this society where individuals are expected to deny what they've witnessed with their own eyes if those experiences are not in concert with a version of history put forth by a group of academics and historians, many of which never lived in those areas, never had the same experience that those people had. Are we supposed to deny what we've seen, deny what we've experienced just to go along with a version of history presented to us by outsiders, whether it's accurate or not? I don't think so. A reporter asked Phil Robertson a question about what he witnessed in the 1960s in the South. He gave you an honest answer, or at least an answer that if it's, if it's incorrect, we don't have any proof of it. That's all that happened. And surely he and none of us are under any obligation to deny what we've seen, to pretend that we saw something we didn't, to pretend something existed that we never were a part of or that we never uh, experienced. That's called honesty. That's called honest historical recollection. And quite frankly, you cannot have a reasonable discussion of history without honesty. And it's scary to me that there's a lot of people out there who expect Phil Robertson and others to pretend that they saw things they did not see or to deny things that they did see just so that their version of history can be accepted as truth. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you.
next time.